Dr. Tulsiani from Toyota Technological Institute of Chicago as our guest speaker. Uh, Mother completed his PhD in 2009 at UC Berkeley, where he was advised by Luca Trevisan. He then spent two years as a postdoc at the Institute of, for Advanced Study and Princeton University. From 2011 onwards, he has been a faculty at TTIC, where he is an associate professor now. Madhur has a broad set of research interests spanning areas of complexity theory, optimization, approximation and inapproximability, pseudo-randomness, and arithmetic combinatorics. He has kindly agreed to give a talk titled Hypergraph Expansion, CSPs, and Algorithmic Decoding of Epsilon Balance Codes. So let's welcome Professor Madhur Dusani and uh, all yours, Madhur. Uh, hey everyone, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for uh, uh, joining the talk uh, this late uh, in the day. And uh, mm, you might have noticed I kind of slightly changed the title of the talk a little bit. Um, so instead of hypergraph expansion, there is splitable regularity, which is actually a consequence of hypergraph expansion. And I hope to tell you uh, uh, more about this consequence. And particularly, at least this is, I hope, one structural property that um, uh, might be a takeaway from the talk. Um, everything I'll speak about is joint work um, with uh, many sort of great students or some of them who were students when the work was done and are now postdocs. Uh, uh, the splitable regularity paper itself is joint with Fernando, uh, who's, who's a UChicago student now at IAS, and uh, Shashank Srivastava, who's at TTIC. And it's also building on earlier ideas with Vedat levy and Dylan Quintana, uh, Vidat was at Waterloo and now is a postdoc, and then Dylan is a, was at U Chicago and now it happened. Okay, uh, feel free to stop me at any point, and also yeah, if um, you feel like it, uh, maybe you can turn your camera on. Uh, it might be nice. To, it's a small group; we can have a conversation. Okay, and yeah, just uh, just let me know if something is unclear or if there is an issue. Okay, okay. so before Hypergraph expansion. Let's just start with graph expansion. So, if I ask you what's an expanding graph, uh, uh, you might have your own favorite definition, and then there are kind of many ways of defining what an expanding graph is. Uh, in particular, uh, you can think of the property that uh, uh, subsets are well connected uh, in the graph. Um, uh, or uh, any set S and its complement have a lot of edges going between them. You might want to look at the adjacency matrix of the graph uh, and uh, after some normalization, say that the eigenvalue or at least the second eigenvalue is small. The first one after the correct normalization is just one. So it's the second one which is informative. Uh, uh, or you can think of it as a proxy for a random graph. In some sense, expanders uh, have are deterministic objects or the objects which we can construct explicitly, which enjoy some properties like random objects uh, in the sense that they provide good samplers, they can provide uh, uh, also codes and etc. So they, they kind of mimic random objects in many interesting ways. Okay, and in some sense these are these definitions are equivalent. Uh, there is of course uh, uh, some cost of translation between these different definitions, but uh, uh, you can use the spectral definition to kind of say how many edges go between sets. So you can use this to also talk about um, some kind of pseudo randomness properties and so on. So these definitions have uh, uh, some uh, sort of connections to each other. And one question which I, mean, I uh, want to at least ask is uh, what is an expanding hypergraph? And let's say three uniform hypergraphs. So you can think of hyper edges as just triangles and uh, I mean, I mean, we will think of k uniform hypergraphs. So a hyper edge will be a subset of k vertices. And, and okay, so what's a good definition of an expanding hypergraph? Okay. Uh, is everyone okay so far? Um, yeah, stop me at any point if something is okay. And well, actually, I don't know. So, I mean, there are many uh, different definitions. There are uh, uh, definitions based on spectral or combinatorial, even topological considerations. Um, they are uh, not necessarily equivalent, and they are not necessarily equivalent to saying that it's a good mimic for, for um, a random hypergraph. And, and in fact, we may not even want it to be a mimic for a random hypergraph. We may not want it to be sort of 
a naive definition of pseudorandom, we'll see that there's some, maybe some more interesting notions of pseudorandom. And uh, to be honest, it, it sort of, uh, uh, we, we, it may depend on what application we have in mind, uh, what is the kind of definition we take away from. And today I hope to tell you about one such definition and maybe some structural consequences of it, which um, uh, with also a structural and algorithmic consequences of it. Okay. So uh, the kind of thing I have in mind uh, is, is constraint satisfaction. Uh, so, and a constraint satisfaction problem is, as the name suggests, it's a, it's a list of constraints on some variables. And we'll look at the version where the goal is to satisfy as many as possible, the maximum uh, number or maximum fraction of constraints. Okay, so it's a maximization version of a CSP. Uh, and we'll attach some sort of number in front of uh, the CSP problem, which is saying what is the arity or what is the number of variables in each constraint. And we're kind of for now looking at things where every uh, constraint has the same number of variables. This can be two, this can be three, this can be K in general. And uh, a two CSP has a natural graph associated with whenever two variables have a constraint, draw an edge between them. So variables are vertices, uh, constraints are edges. A three CSP has a natural three uniform hypergraph associated with it, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So we can uh, naturally kind of ask, uh, uh, The properties of this graph uh, or the properties of this instance, uh, do they have uh, any consequence on how easy or difficult this problem is? And in particular, there is actually a large body of literature, which is kind of not just interesting for the result, but also for the kind of swath of techniques it develops, uh, uh, which sort of um, has various ways of formalizing the fact that um, uh, if you look at two CSPs, uh, then associated graph, if it has some expansion or pseudorandom uh, properties, then uh, the constraint satisfaction problem is easy. Okay. There are different notions of expanding or pseudorandom in these different papers, and uh, uh, well, mostly the same notion of easy, but uh, that can also vary. But the notion of easy is that you can at least approximately solve this constraint satisfaction problem or approximately uh, uh, find or what is the maximum number of satisfiable constraints. Okay. And this is an incomplete list. Uh, this is not an exhaustive one by any means. Uh, these are just some which are maybe more relevant to the kind of things I'll talk about. But yeah, I apologize uh, if there is some paper you can think of which, I, which is not on the list. This is still very, very incomplete. Okay. Okay. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry for this basic question, but uh, sort of what is the difference between X2 and X37? So. Uh, uh, are, are they referring to different things or uh, uh, they're just uh, different uh, variables right sorry so, uh, uh, so uh, this x2 refers to the vertices x37 to edges or something like that no 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 so uh, i'm thinking of okay in the graph uh, conversion i'm just thinking of um, let's say a graph where every variable so x2 is just the name of a variable uh, so we can let's call it uh, vertex number two. Uh, X37 is just the name of another variable. Uh, similarly, X9 is the name of another variable. And uh, uh, X23 is just the name of another variable. So these are all uh, names of variables. And whenever we have uh, a constraint, we draw an edge. And presumably we have some collection of N variables and some collection of M edges. Uh, I'm not showing you all of them, but uh, uh, each variable is just one vertex. X2 is a separate vertex from X37. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. And the sort of question I'm interested in, or at least uh, uh, want to talk about today, is um, uh, is there a good notion of um, uh, CSPs on expanding hypergraphs where then an analog analogous statement holds that um, uh, CSPs on expanded hypergraphs are in some sense easy or the expansion properties are somehow interesting. They provide us some structural handle on the instance which lets us use our favorite algorithmic techniques to argue about them. So it's not just that uh, I'm interested in these being uh, 
easy, but uh, you kind of want to understand what is the property that actually makes them easy. And then what is the, does this tell me something structural about hypergraphs? Okay. And one kind of uh, sort of thing to note uh, off the bat is um, uh, random is not always a good proxy. If you if you try to look at um, uh, so the three CSP we were looking at, for example, here is um, uh, linear equations in three variables modulo two, so or three XOR if you like, um, and uh, a random system of three XOR is actually pretty hard. It's um, uh, sort of uh, even to get any non-trivial approximation for um, what is the maximum fraction of satisfiable constraints uh, is hard for any algorithm that we know of so far. Okay, and it's conjectured to be hard uh, NP hard on average, but we don't know how to prove NP hardness results yet in this average case sense. Uh, but it, it's hard for uh, uh, pretty much any algorithm that we know or we have thrown at this problem so far. Okay, so in some sense, uh, maybe the notion of expansion or the pseudo random that we are interesting uh, interested in, uh, maybe we should be careful about mimicking random, uh, at least naively. Uh, some things are known. So uh, a, a dense instance where uh, by dense, I mean uh, uh, something where uh, the number of constraints is roughly as large as it uh, can be. If you have uh, three variables in every constraint, there are n variables. You can have at most uh, n choose three or n cube constraints. Uh, uh, and uh, instances which have roughly that kind of, um, uh, sort of uh, density are, are easy in the sense you can you can get a good approximation to the maximum satisfiable number of constraints. And uh, this follows from work of Fries and Kannan, which I'll talk more about, uh, which define something called a regularity lemma and used it uh, uh, to, to uh, talk about CSPs. There are notions which were defined, interesting notions of uh, kind of pseudo randomness that were defined for sparse hypergraphs, um, not just dense, but uh, even uh, um, uh, really sparse hypergraphs, um, which are a different kind of pseudo randomness. I'll not go through these notions, but um, I want to mention that this is a uh, an interesting notion of the pseudo randomness for hypergraphs, which is not quite uh, captured by uh, random hypergraphs. Okay. And in, this is something which is called a local spectral version of high dimensional expansion. Uh, 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 the definition is a bit involved and I'll have to tell you about simplicial complexes, etc. So I'll uh, not do that. I'll tell you actually a slightly different definition, uh, which um, uh, we called uh, splitability, which is also a notion of pseudo randomness again for uh, local spectral uh, or for, for hypergraphs. Uh, it's uh, it's implied by this notion of uh, local spectral expansion uh, defined by Dinur and Kaufman. Uh, so it's a, in some sense a weaker requirement, uh, and it suffices for um, our algorithmic techniques. It, it gives us good approximation algorithms, and in particular. Uh, these also lead to uh, some uh, new algorithms for decoding codes by thinking of them as constraint satisfaction problems, which I'll talk about later. So, but I want to emphasize a little bit uh, this particular notion, which I'll define in a minute. Um, and there are two kinds of techniques, roughly, that can take advantage, and, and that they are related in previous literature. Also, uh, for two CSPs, we have seen some interplay between these techniques, um, and uh, in particular. Uh, we can we can take advantage of them using uh, uh, SDP hierarchies or uh, uh, so-called uh, regularity lemmas. Okay, and. Uh, I'll tell you about the latter. I'll talk more about uh, regularity lemmas because um, SDP hierarchies tend to be a bit more technical and also regularity lemmas actually give us uh, very efficient algorithms uh, compared to what SDP hierarchies do. Uh, 
uh, I mean, they're different in their power a little bit, but uh, I'll, uh, for this talk, I'll focus on regularity lemmas and, and um, what is this definition splitability, how it leads to uh, some structural properties like regularity and how we can use it for applications such as solving CSPs or, uh, or maybe decoding codes, etc. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah, mother, one clarification. So which two things do you want to relate using these tools? Could you repeat that again? Uh, so I want to define splitability, show you how splitability need, leads to regularity, and then how regularity leads to algorithms for CSPs and decoding codes, etc. I see. Okay. Any more questions? So this pre scan is for uh, graphs or for hypergraphs as well? Sorry. Uh, so this is for graphs. It generalizes the usual notion of uh, this is for hypergraphs. Sorry. It generalizes the notion of expansion of graphs. Uh, but interestingly, it's a notion of exp uh, some sort of uh, pseudo randomness or some notion of uh, structured pseudo randomness for hypergraphs, which we can exploit algorithmically. I'll define it on the next slide. And so, so I mean, it, it defined in general for hypergraphs, but it, 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 it's a generalization of what we usually think of expansion for graphs. And so, so I was asking, does pre scan and is that for hypergraphs or for graphs? Because you mentioned. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, I missed the first part of the question. Free scan then, uh, also works for hypergraphs. So, I mean, uh, because in the dense setting, uh, um, you can, I mean, in fact, I'll give a general proof which will actually prove it in uh, all those settings. But in, in the dense setting, you can use it uh, uh, directly also. It, it, it's not uh, the, the question is, what is the sparse? Uh, uh, assumption under which it can be applied to hypergraphs, and that turns out to be splitability. So, quick question, Madhu. So, is there like, so, uh, I mean, if I remember correctly, this local spectral expansion has a, mm. it can be, again, it kind of reduces to, when you look at like standard graphs, there is, it kind of matches the, like what you would at least understand as the spectral version of. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So splitability also has a uh, like a, yes okay image yeah. okay but for standard graphs it will be the notion of eigenvalue expansion that uh, uh, you've probably seen uh, many many times it's uh, okay. so it, it, it's not different okay, okay. So both so, of them them are the same for graphs uh, but uh, just I mean it, it's not even. I mean, like I am making maybe a bit too much of a fuss about this splitability, so let me just uh, define it. It's not a very involved notion, but uh, okay. it's uh, uh, something which uh, helps us uh, build algorithms. So let me just uh, define this notion and kind of sure. not necessarily shout it in mystery or anything. Okay, so uh, so let's say uh, I have. Um, uh, uh, a set of k tuples, uh, and we can think of it as an ordered hypergraph. The notion is slightly just easier to define for ordered hypergraph. If you want unordered ones, uh, just put all possible orderings. Uh, you'll blow up the size by k factorial, but uh, 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 we are thinking of k as, as a constant, uh, two, three, four, and so on. So it doesn't really change things, and we are all friends here. So it's, it's not... Uh, a big deal uh, to go with between unordered and ordered, but let me just uh, define it for ordered. And uh, let's just use this uh, notation WAB to basically say, look at a K tuple and only look at the coordinates which are numbered between A and B. So if let's say uh, A is two and uh, B is four, then I'm just looking at the uh, coordinates two, three, and four in every k-tuple. I'm just deleting all the other coordinates. Okay, so this is just a fancy way of writing it, that it is a collection of subtuples such that there is uh, uh, some completion, something you can attach before and something you can attach later so that it completes to one of your valid k-tuples in the collection w. Okay, uh, Okay. so far, um, everyone okay with uh, the definition of wab? So, okay. And now we'll define uh, and yeah, let, let's, uh, okay, I'll, I'm cheating a little bit, but let's define this matrix, uh, uh, which is S sub L. With, uh, with basically, you kind of break K tuples at point L. So look at a K tuple, or sort of, uh, 
or look at all collections which appear, appear as a prefix as the first L coordinates in a K tuple. Look at all uh, uh, subtuples which um, appear um, as um, the last uh, uh, K minus L uh, coordinates in a tuple and uh, think of them as indexing the rows and columns of this matrix respectively. Now, it's not necessarily true that if you look at the first half of some tuple and the second half of some tuple together, they join to form uh, a valid K tuple, right? I mean, the, 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 the first half could have come from some tuple T1, the second half could, could have come from T2. I don't know if I join them together, I'll get something. If it is the case that when I join the sort of tuple or like the subtuple indexing the row and the subtuple indexing the column, uh, then uh, if I if it is the case, then when I join them, I actually indeed get uh, a valid K tuple. I'll put a one in the matrix, otherwise well, I'll put a zero. Okay. So it's a bipartite graph. It's just a bipartite graph between prefixes and suffixes or sort of things which appear as first L coordinates and things which appear as last K minus L coordinates. There is an edge whenever the whenever you join them, you get something valid as a K tuple. Okay. Okay. Uh, is the definition of this matrix S sub L okay? Think of a matrix, bipartite graph, and so on. I'm cheating a little bit. I'm kind of assuming that uh, this bipartite graph is regular uh, on both sides. So that's why I'm putting one. Otherwise, you have to kind of look at uh, some sort of uh, probability distributions on the uh, sets of uh, uh, on, on the rows and columns. Um, but yeah, ignore that. Uh, I'll give you examples where we can see that you can get interesting collections even when things are regular. So. Uh, yeah, otherwise there's a slight complication, but it's mostly just uh, bookkeeping. Okay. So let me understand this a bit. So WAB is like a projection set. You're looking at uh, W, the, all the tuples in capital W and projecting them to- Precisely. Like, yeah, yeah, this read. And it's a, exactly. So now you're saying I look at all like, so this matrix SL is obtained by, you fix some L, you look at the projections onto one, so if there is any projection such that, uh, yeah, like if you go up, like do the yeah. reverse of the projection, and you do have a element in capital W, put a one. Yeah, exactly. And maybe let's uh, uh, do an exercise. Let's just think of K equals two. So W is a set of pairs, okay? Uh, and we can think of it as a bipartite graph, uh, right? So let's just uh, think of, K equals two. Uh, so it's a set of ordered pairs. So we can think of it as a bipartite graph, or if you want to think of a unordered or like a undirected graph, you just kind of put both orderings here, whichever you prefer. Um, and so then it's the two cover of uh, undirected graph, whichever uh, you, you prefer to think of. Um, and every tuple kind of looks like uh, an I and a J. And now let's put down um, the i's on one side, the j's on one side. Um, so these are indexing the rows. Uh, these are indexing the columns. And uh, you have an edge between i and j exactly if ij is a valid two tuple that appears in your w. So it's an edge in your bipartite graph. So uh, for k equals two, we are just describing a bipartite graph. Nothing fancier. Uh, everyone okay with that? Yes. Okay. And for larger k, we are basically describing a bipartite bipartite graph with this sort of funky set of vertices. Uh, and maybe uh, as we vary l, we are defining a somewhat larger collection of bipartite graphs. Maybe k minus one of them because l could be anything between one and k minus one. Okay. And I'll, ca I'll call this hypergraph splittable. Uh, uh, if each one of these bipartite graphs is a bipartite expander. So uh, given a hypergraph, I obtain these K minus one graphs out of it. And I'm going to say uh, the hypergraph is splittable if each of these bipartite graphs is an expander. Okay? And formally I kind of say it's an expander by saying that the second singular value of this matrix because I'm only writing this rectangular part, not the full adjacency matrix of this bipartite graph. Um, so the second singular value is at most some number tau, which will sort of quantify how strong uh, the expansion is. Um, and we'll just look for a uniform bound. So it's uh, tau for every L. Okay. 
and again going back to our uh, case of k equals 2 uh, we are going to say this two tuple or this bipartite graph is splittable if this bipartite graph is an expander so uh, there the notion of splittability just collapses to expansion there is only one interesting l to look at for uh, for k equals 2 everyone okay so far so maybe like just for yeah so for k equals to 3 this would be like you're looking at two bipartite graphs the, the first one is obtained by projecting onto the like the, let's see this is the first vertex and sort of combining the other two and yeah so yes yes okay yeah and i'll, I'll uh, talk about that in a minute but I mean, if nothing else, I hope uh, people kind of can get this definition out of the talk. Uh, uh, I should say that, okay, first, this is uh, later we found that there's also an analogous definition in case of higher order correlation between random variables, which was defined by Mosell in 2010, which is basically the same definition um, in sort of state things. And I don't know if Anand remembers, but we also tried to come up with some definition like this, but we didn't know what object satisfies this. Um, uh, so long, long time ago, uh, in some sort of prehistoric times, but okay. Uh, so these are, uh, I mean, it's not necessarily uh, a very new idea, but now there are some kind of nice examples of it and then some nice applications. This is one, then like this was formalized in our paper, but it's not necessarily something which is unrelated to things before. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when is it okay to put one? Uh, like uh, you were talking about some normalizations uh, for the general uh, yeah, yeah. graph. Uh, yeah. right? So we mm -hmm. need to put that one there. Like, right. So I mean, in general, these are graphs, right? So if you don't have a regular graph, you try to define uh, the uh, transition matrix which comes from random walk on, on that graph. So you will put uh, not one, but uh, some probability matrix which comes from uh, the the number of neighbors of every vertex in this bipartite graph and you would uh, look at uh, kind of singular values uh, corresponding to the stationary measures on the left and right sides uh, so there will be some weighted distributions uh, i mean it's not uh, anything different from what we usually do when we look at graphs which are not regular for regular graphs we can just look at the adjacency matrix talk about the eigenvalues of that and if the degree is D, we divide the adjacency matrix by D and then the eigenvalues are between minus one and one. And then we, it makes sense to say the second eigenvalue is less than 0.1 or 0.5 or whatever. Right? If it's not a regular graph, we don't look at uh, the adjacency matrix, but we look at the matrix, which is um, you know, this uh, D to the minus half times the adjacency times D to the minus half, where D is the diagonal matrix with entries uh, uh, given by the degrees. And now this is a matrix whose eigenvalues we actually study, uh, and something similar uh, needs to be done uh, in the in the case of uh, this, uh, not regular bipartite graphs. But yeah, it, it's not conceptually anything different. It I mean, uh, it's just uh, slightly cleaner to just talk of zero one matrices. That, that's all. So another maybe that's besides the point is it at least this t splittability seems like a testing for this is a, it, it seems tractable as in unlike the yeah. like tensor like the tensor versions you can compute these sls like especially for small k and just test yeah. like a bipartite and just compute the spectral value i agree testing for this is easy but i should also say that the testing for the the noor kaufman notion that i mentioned is also easy uh, okay. It's actually eigenvalue about it, it's defined in terms of eigenvalues of a finite uh, uh, sort of polynomial size collection of graphs. So you basically write down all of those polynomial size, uh, uh, this uh, every one of those uh, polynomial number of graphs and test the eigenvalues. So it's also possible to test for that notion. I okay. mean, of course, the other notions uh, like in terms of if you try to define the uh, some notion of a tensor eigenvalue, etc. Okay. There, you don't know how to test. Yeah, that's true. So okay. one question, like, so you actually wrote it like a, I mean, that's sort of curiously in a single di direction that local uh, expansion implies splittability. Mm -hmm. So you, so there are examples where the convert, like the other direction is in. Yes. So I'll give you an example on the next slide. Okay. Um, um, okay so let's go to examples. Uh, with somehow, yeah. Uh, so a couple of examples which. Um, 
uh, as we already saw for k equals 2 we just get graphs uh, for uh, the the notion uh, this uh, local spectral expansion which was defined by dinur and kaufman it's possible to show that this gives a uh, uh, splittable collections and this is what we uh, showed in our uh, paper using semi definite programming and this was independently also proved by uh, dickstein and dinur with actually somewhat better parameters uh, so uh, but i mean yeah so if, uh, they were interested in different applications than the stp kind of setting uh, and another example which um, might be even easier to see is just the collection of uh, uh, walks so if you think of a graph uh, and now let's look at length 3 walks on this graph so when you do a walk of length 3 you visit four vertices uh, possibly you repeat vertices i'm not going to penalize you for it that's fine uh, so uh, and we look at uh, these four tuples that occur as walks okay, not every four tuple can occur as a walk uh, you have to find edges to walk on uh, but this is a collection of uh, 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 ordered four tuples if you like uh, and i claim that this is actually splittable uh, and in fact you can also check uh, if you kind of work with the definition that this is not a local spectral uh, expander etc so i mean this is this definition is um, is strictly weak okay. and uh, just uh, maybe a quick check for ourselves of why uh, this defines a splittable collection um, this uh, set of walks um, uh, well if you um, uh, sort of i mean there are different uh, uh, this uh, sl matrices to look at let's look at s2 which is kind of the more interesting one um, uh, and uh, s2 the rows and columns are both indexed by a kind of valid two tuples which can appear as part of a walk what is a two tuple that can appear as part of a walk an edge so the first two steps in a walk or the first two vertices have to be an edge the second two the last two vertices have to be an edge so rows and columns are just indexed by edges ordered edges if you like but uh, edges uh, and the edge i1 i2 and i3 i4 are joined if they together can form a valid uh, sort of walk with four vertices or length 3 and they can form a valid walk if i2 and i3 are joined also so if i2 and i3 is an edge everyone okay so far yes yes and if it's a deregular graph uh, you can check that if you kind of maybe rearrange the rows and columns of this matrix or sort them slightly differently then this is basically the adjacency matrix of the graph tensored by a d cross d all ones matrix um, uh, if you maybe yeah i guess sort the rows by i2 maybe and columns by i3 or something so uh, so and then and then sort of permuting rows and columns maybe even differently doesn't change singular values all we are interested in is the second singular value so uh, if if g is uh, if g is an expander um, then uh, the sigma uh, the second singular value will basically be the second eigen value of g so if g is a good expander then uh, the collection of walks will form a splittable hypergraph and in fact this is what is used in these coding applications um, it turns out to give a better hypergraph than these local spectral expanders etc so uh, the, the fact that walks form a splittable collection is actually uh, useful okay. but any questions about this uh, yeah not showing the full computation sorry but it's a uh, yeah it, it's a uh, relatively easy uh, once you think about it for 2 3 minutes to convince yourself that the matrix indeed looks like this okay so now uh, i need to talk about regularity and then some of the structural property that i'm interested in and uh, uh, let me uh, first talk about regularity for graphs which is um, and again i'm happy if you can just kind of take away the statement of splittability and the statement of what a regularity lemma for splittable collections can look like okay so before that let's look at what a regularity lemma for graphs can look like okay. and this is a, a, a lemma by fries and kanan which has many applications also many variations later uh, basically says that uh, given a graph and the statement is only interesting for dense graphs uh, uh, you can kind of build a nice approximation for this graph which lets you count the uh, count the edges between s and t in a very uh, sort of simple way okay for any sets s and t and 
the way you count these edges is that given a graph, you can come up with a collection of uh, subsets S1 to SR, T1 to TR for some small r, and some coefficients C1 to CR, such that if you want to count the edges between uh, S and T, you just uh, uh, look at uh, how S intersects uh, each of these uh, SJs, how T intersects each one of these TJs, uh, uh, and then add them with these coefficients. So uh, if you had a complete bipartite graph between SJ and TJ, uh, then the number of edges um, between uh, S and T would have just been uh, S intersection SJ and T intersection TJ. So uh, if you, for every SJ and TJ, if you just had a complete bipartite graph, uh, then the number of edges would have been what I have written by these intersections. And what the regularity lemma is saying is that you can basically approximate your graph by some weighted combination of uh, complete bipartite graphs. Okay. There are other ways of phrasing it, uh, but uh, this is the one I'll kind of uh, generalize with. Uh, also note that the error is epsilon n squared. Uh, so if the total number of edges in your graph was uh, 100n, then the error, uh, the, the statement is backwards. I mean, the error is so large that uh, 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 the approximation is useless. Okay, so the statement is interesting only if the total number of in, in your edges in your graph is, is significantly more than epsilon n square, then this is telling you at least a somewhat precise estimate. Okay? And so this is a statement which makes sense for uh, dense graphs. Okay? This is uh, freeze kind of regularity lemma. I'm just, um, not stating anything new, just restating it. Everyone okay so far? Okay, and uh, let's just uh, check that it actually gives us algorithms for solving CSPs, and this, fact, this was one of the motivations in the paper. Uh, so uh, let's say we want to solve uh, max cut, uh, which is just a question of finding a subset of vertices, uh, uh, S such that the number of edges crossing between S and S complement is as large as possible. Okay. Uh, and again, because of the regularity lemma, we can write this. Um, uh, if we have these SJs and TJs, we can write the number of edges uh, that we want to count uh, uh, as uh, uh, in terms of our approximation. Uh, and notice that this only depends on. Uh, um, So it only depends on S intersection SJ, S intersection and S complement intersection TJ for all the pieces. And so basically we only need to know the values of uh, these numbers uh, to solve the max cut problem. And uh, I mean, it might happen that these numbers are related in some complicated way that maybe SJ and TJ have some overlap and so on, but let's just get rid of that overlap. Let's look at all possible uh, pieces in this partition, whether they intersect S1 or not, S2 or not, uh, S3 or not, and S5 uh, or not, T1 or not, and so on. So this will uh, we'll get um, a partition with uh, two to the order one over epsilon square pieces. And uh, now S can be arbitrary within every one of these pieces. It can, you can uh, uh, pick any subset of uh, that piece uh, and uh, write down what the size of that subset is, uh, and that will give you an estimate on the number of edges uh, crossing S and S complement. Basically, a brute force search over all of these, or maybe slightly cleverer enumerations, uh, give you an algorithm for solving max cut. So all you need to do is to figure out the density, or just basically go over all possible options for the density of S within each one of these uh, pieces highlighted in different colors in the diagram. And this is basically the algorithm for approximating CS, uh, max cut using uh, uh, using regularity lemma. Any questions? Okay. 
So let me just give you a couple of different statements and then maybe slowly massage it into uh, some version of a splittable regularity lemma. So, uh, so far this is um, the statement we saw just written slightly differently that um, instead of thinking of the number of edges, we are going to think of an indicator vector for the set S, an indicator vector for the set T and multiply them with the matrix, so the adjacency matrix of the graph K sub G. Uh, and so this is exactly the same as uh, the number of um, edges between S and T, just written differently in terms of matrices and vectors. Um, okay. And then from matrices, let me move away to functions. So let me think of this as um, a matrix is just a function on uh, the row and column indices. Once you give me a row and column index, I can give you an entry. Uh, and a vector is just a function on the index uh, set. So let me just think of it as a function. Uh, uh, and an important thing here is uh, sort of what am I taking the inner product with respect to or what is the measure under which? And then here it's just uh, the uniform measure. Uh, and uh, so this is just a restatement uh, of uh, the freeze condon regularity lemma. I haven't done anything new yet. Uh, I've just rewritten uh, uh, what we what we saw on the previous slide. Just uh, uh, in terms of uh, vectors and matrices and then uh, functions. Okay. Any questions? So that n square is the reason why that you bring it in and that's why it's a uniform measure. Precisely. Thank you. Yeah. So this n square kind of got absorbed in the uniform measure or the sort of uh, that's why I had the uniform measure here. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of the uniform measure will be important. So yeah, thanks for uh, clarifying that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and now actually there is a more general uh, regularity lemma one can prove, um, and maybe I'll kind of prove this later. But uh, uh, let me just mention the statement uh, in this uh, kind of uh, vein of thinking about functions, etc. So let's say you have any function g from some space x. Let's say it takes values between minus one and one. In particular, zero and one are both allowed, uh, or you can pick. And some class F of functions, which uh, 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 which serve as distinguishers, um, uh, or which which we want to basically fool. So this class F of function, there's something which we'll will kind of uh, uh, fill in for in a minute, but. Uh, for now, just think of it as some sort of barrier functions or some things which we want to uh, fool. And we want to build an approximation for G, which fools all these functions in this class F. Okay. And the regularity lemma says that actually you can build a collection or sort of build an approximation using functions in this class F. So there exists an approximation H, which is actually a weighted combination of functions or distinguisher functions or functions from your class F. Again, the same sort of things apply not too many functions such that uh, G and F, uh, G and H are indistinguishable uh, in the sense that uh, if you try to look at the correlation with any uh, function in F or the inner product, uh, it's small. Okay. And you can even start with your favorite uh, probability measure and then uh, the full proofs actually require changing this measure a little bit. So, uh, so there is a statement which uh, lets you start with whatever measure you want. Any questions? So this is, uh, I mean, this is kind of abstract. Let's uh, make it a little concrete. Um, so uh, going back to our graph case, uh, the function G was just a distance matrix of a graph, which we kind of went for graphs to matrices to functions. Um, uh, the class of functions we wanted to fool were just things which were uh, uh, sort of so-called cut functions or uh, functions which uh, were indicators of subsets, but these are functions on two tuples. So uh, these are sort of indicators of complete bipartite graph, if you want, uh, between S and T. Uh, uh, another shorthand for writing these functions is uh, maybe just uh, one S tensor one T, which just means that you kind of feed the first input to S and the second input to T. Okay. 
And so the functions we wanted to fool were just these things which were indicators of subsets or pairs of those. And what the regularity lemma said was that, well, you can build an approximation um, in terms of uh, these indicators. So you can write the adjacency matrix as a linear combination of uh, a small number of functions um, from the same set F, uh, such that they fool any other function from this set F. We saw that this was equivalent to the statement uh, we wrote down. The, the measure mu we work with is just a uniform measure on uh, n square. Okay. And there's a generalization when you kind of tweak the measure a little bit. You can define it for expanders. Um, you can uh, solve CSPs on expanders using this, etc., uh, instead of uh, just dense graphs and so on. So that's a general uh, regularity statement. Any questions? So the functional distance does not matter here. Like I just want to understand the definition of uh, this expression g minus h. Uh -huh. uh, can, can you just speak on that? Like, uh, so this G minus H. Um, yeah, yeah, just let's start. Yeah, for a general. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, uh, so this is just, um, I mean, uh, mu is a measure. So I'm going to think of expectation over X, uh, G of X minus H of X times F of X, and where X is sampled according to mu. Got it. Okay. So it's some correlation, but uh, like the weight on the inputs is given by mu. And for for the graph, we are just thinking of the uniform distribution. So every pair i j is equally likely with probability one over n square. Okay. Okay. Uh, and well, okay. Uh, I don't know how to be rich and successful, but that's the wrong talk for it. Anyway, let me prove you. How, let me show you how to prove weak regularity very quickly. It's um, I mean, actually, the proof is. Uh, uh, I mean, again, this is one thing which I hope uh, people can take away from the talk. It's just a one line proof. It's beautiful. It also proves the regularity lemma and then gives algorithms for graphs, etc. that we talked about. So. Uh, I mean, we are trying to build this approximation H. We'll start with our approximator as zero, the function which is just zero everywhere. And then we'll just say, is this a good approximator? Okay. It's a good approximator if for every function f, uh, this inner product um, is, is small, is less than or equal to epsilon. And I've kind of removed the absolute value. I've sort of uh, 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 basically uh, taken the negation of all functions in my class and also included it so that I don't have to write absolute values. Uh, either ft or minus ft is fine. It's, uh, so. Uh, that's just a uh, slight simplification. Uh, so now uh, the approximation H is is good if uh, if this condition is not satisfied. Right? If no such uh, distinguisher exists, or if for all distinguishers this inner product is less than epsilon. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, there's always this uh, mu hiding here. Uh, and also, yeah, and uh, all inner products are with respect to the same mu. So, uh, and if it's not a good uh, approximation H, then FT was the kind of distinguisher I just added to my collection. Okay. So I just changed my H sub T plus one uh, to be H sub T plus epsilon times F sub T. Someone has a different opinion, just include them in your group. Okay. Keep going. Uh, that's the construction. Now, I mean, if this loop terminates, it gives me a good approximation. The only thing I have to prove to you is that it terminates. And the proof is very simple. It's just let's track the norm or the L2 norm of G minus H. I mean, again, if you, depending on how you look at it, this is an energy increment, energy decrement argument. This is gradient descent, whatever you like. It's uh, the same proof. Uh, uh, let's look at the L2 norm. And the L2 norm, uh, because of the definition of H, uh, I can just uh, uh, open it up and write like this. This quantity is greater than epsilon by definition, and this is less than or equal to one because f sub t was also, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, maybe I should have said that, but f sub t is also our functions to plus minus one or uh, between minus one and one, so the L2 norm is at most one. So uh, 
this decreases by by at least epsilon square at every step because the negative term is at least two epsilon square and the positive term is at most epsilon square. So it goes down at every step, can't keep going down forever. The starting norm for G again was at most one because G maps to plus minus one. So at some point uh, it, in the process should stop in one over epsilon square steps and then, then I have my distinguish. Okay, and now let me at least give you the statement of the splittable regularity. Yeah. So maybe not rich and successful, but miserly. So is epsilon square uh, tight or? I mean, ah. like, like something like strong convexity, but maybe not the right. But yeah, like, yeah, okay. Is it tight? Right. So okay. in this generic sense, epsilon square is tight and can construct examples. Uh, just like, I mean, uh, this is basically gradient descent. So we can uh, okay. uh, show it in ways. Uh, um, yeah, and it's a, it's a good question, sort of, are there special classes uh, when epsilon square is not tight? And yes, uh, uh, but I haven't seen too many applications in the regularity setting. In the optimization setting, of course, we know things where epsilon square is not tight, uh, an interesting yeah. assumption. Yeah, I, I actually, it's a good question to find analogs in the kind of regularity setup. And yeah, I mean, it should be the case, but I don't know of very good applications for this yet. Okay. Okay, and now let me just state uh, the splittable regularity lemma and maybe I'm running out of time. So please let me know whenever I, you want me to stop. Uh, I'm happy as long as I can at least say that statement. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, uh, at least tell you some structural property of splittable collections, which is useful for CSPs like uh, the regularity lemma. So again, we are given now a splittable collection. So in particular, this is uh, the statement is non-trivial even when k equals two because it gives a regularity lemma for uh, expander graphs, uh, which was, I mean, statements like that were known before. It generalizes them, uh, but uh, for k equals three and so on, this is a new statement. Um, uh, and it's sort of similar. We are given a function g, which uh, now maps from w to minus one one. Uh, the class of uh, 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 Distinguishers is again the same kind of uh, things that we had 1s tensor 1t, but now this is kind of f1 tensor f2, so on till fk. So there are functions with take k inputs and just you know, compute f1 on the first input, f2 on the second, and so on. And uh, we'll just uh, call them k split functions. And uh, the regularity lemma says that if you want to fool uh, the set of k split functions, um, you can build an approximator out of k-split functions. Okay, the important thing is that the error on the right-hand side uh, is sensitive to the size of uh, w. Okay, and uh, so uh, it makes sense even when w is sparse because it's actually the uniform measure uh, on uh, n to the k on the left will uh, have a one over n to the k, uh, as was observed for graphs and. Uh, the, the error on the right uh, uh, kind of makes sense. Once you cancel those, it's just the epsilon times the size of W. So it makes sense even when you have a, a sparse collection W. Okay. And this can be done for splittable collections. I mean, even for graphs, uh, such regularity lemmas are not true for all graphs. They are true for expanding graphs. Um, and uh, so you need something about the splittability. And uh, the condition we need is that the splittability is, again, uh, bounded uh, in terms of the quality of approximation you want and uh, some function of k. Okay. So the 2 to the 10 is an arbitrary constant, ignore it. But, okay. And again, proving this regularity lemma is not too hard. What I'm hiding in all of this is that there are algorithms to compute uh, these uh, things. And, uh, uh, and, and those algorithms, I mean, it might seem from this proof that the algorithm is also written here. But actually, the key step is finding this f. And all this algorithmic task actually comes out to finding this f sub t. And the non-trivial part in this whole uh, is to making make this algorithm, make, make it fast, etc., which gives us algorithms. And uh, if you have a couple of minutes, I can tell you, just as in case of max cut, why this leads to an algorithm for CSPs. Um, uh, but yeah, again, please let me know whenever you need, need to stop or send me a chat message, uh, if you, uh, if, depending on the time. Okay? I don't want to keep you too late. But 
I mean, going back to a CSP, let's think of uh, linear equations modulo 2 or 3XOR. Uh, then uh, every constraint is just uh, a linear equation of this form. What we are going to find is an assignment um, to variables which satisfies as many equations. Let's translate things to functions uh, so that we can apply regularity. Let's think of the right hand sides of equations as giving us a function on W. Okay, and we'll think of a plus minus one function. It's slightly cleaner to do arithmetic with. Uh, so uh, zero one value naturally translates to a plus minus one value. We can think of an assignment as a function on the set of variables. Again, exactly the same way. And uh, we can arithmeticize uh, uh, this sort of um, uh, the, whether the constraint is satisfies or not is just in terms of these functions. So this expression is um, uh, one if the constraint is satisfied, zero otherwise. And the goal is to maximize um, uh, this expression or uh, uh, just the, I mean, the, the first part is constant. So the, uh, the goal is to basically uh, uh, maximize the, the G times this uh, product with F tensor F, etc. And as before, by regularity, uh, instead of G, where we can work with H, H is nothing but some collection of uh, these uh, split functions, in this case, three split functions. And now importantly, because the inner product was over the uh, uniform distribution on N cubed, uh, uh, we can write this as a function of three different inner products, uh, F1, uh, sorry, FJ1 with F alpha, FJ2 with F alpha, FJ3 with F alpha. And so again, it, it sort of comes down to enumerating all possible values for um, uh, these inner products. There's only a finite number of these inner products. Um, uh, like before, we form a partition of size 2 to the 1 over epsilon square and then uh, kind of go over some guesses in each of these pieces of the partition, which gives us uh, which gives us a new enumeration over all possible values of these inner products. And that gives us an algorithm for solving the CSP. Okay. Nothing uh, very different from max cut once you have the statement of the regularity lemma. Proving the regularity lemma take some work even for k equals 2. As I said, it implies a non-trivial regularity lemma for expanders. I didn't quite tell you how to prove it, but uh, it, it's not, uh, yeah, this kind of maybe one more trick on top of the things that I told you about uh, uh, abstract regularity, etc. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe uh, I'll stop here uh, if you want. Uh, yeah, again, uh, um, organizers. I think, uh, yeah, I think we can continue. With this. Uh, sorry? I think oh. we can continue. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I'll just mention that maybe decoding codes, or at least the right kind of codes, um, is also basically solving constraint satisfaction problems. So, in particular, there are these constructions of codes which are called uh, direct sum codes. Uh, so, uh, which again can be thought of as coming from an ordered hypergraph or just even an unordered hypergraph. So uh, let's say uh, we have uh, a string x1 to xn in some, uh, or we can think of them, these living bits in F2. Uh, and now let's form a new string, uh, where, which is indexed by tuples in W, uh, where if the tuple in W is I1, I2, I3, let's say I just uh, take the sum of the three bits uh, mod 2 so that I get a new bit uh, corresponding to. And uh, this is an operation which maps uh, strings to strings. It's actually just matrix multiplication. You can think of this uh, matrix A in which every row corresponds to ones in the positions where you have in position I1, I2, I3, let's say, and you're just multiplying it with X. Okay. And uh, if you have a uh, sort of, um, and this is a way of translating a collection of strings um, in F2 to the n, which um, can be thought of as a code, to a collection of strings in a larger space, um, which uh, can be a code with better properties. And in fact, uh, Tashma's celebrated epsilon balance code in 2017 had this sort of construction. You can start with some base code, take a clever and nice collection of strings, which actually comes from walks and graphs and so on. And uh, this collection W is a splittable collection, we can prove. Uh, and uh, translate it to a larger code. And now I'll just 
say that the question of decoding this code is the question of solving a CSP. Because suppose you transmitted this Y, there were errors, you got Y tilde. The goal is to find a Y which agrees with Y tilde as much as possible. What is Y? Y is just, uh, every bit of Y is just a sum of some three bits of X. So it's uh, good enough to find collection of bits X, uh, which agrees with Y tilde as much as possible, or sort of um, you want to solve as many of these constraints given by Xi1 plus Xi2 plus Xi3 equals to Y tilde I1, I2, I3. And the goal is to satisfy as many of them as possible. And again, we saw that uh, if we have splitability, we get regularity. If we have regularity, we can solve CSPs. Uh, and, uh, and I kind of sketched that if we can solve CSPs, we can decode codes. And this gives us uh, new algorithms for decoding this code, this, which was proposed by Tashma in 2017. It was a breakthrough construction. By that time, it did not come with any uh, coding or decoding algorithms. But all we need to know about this code is that uh, the collection W, which defines it, is splittable. And once you prove that, uh, you are in business. Okay, uh, let's let's stop there. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, tell you some uh, interesting uh, future uh, uh, questions. Um, so, in particular, uh, so this gives us satisfactory understanding of what it means to uh, recover the best Y or some sort of unique decoding. Uh, it gives us some handle on what. It means to do list decoding if there's a lot of corruption, but it's not satisfactory yet. There's some recent progress using the alternate approach on semi-definite programs, et cetera, uh, by Richardson and Roy, but we don't have a complete understanding yet. Going back to regularity lemmas, there are many other kind of regularity lemmas on graphs, and it's kind of interesting to see uh, if there are analogs for suitable collections. And uh, all of these things, regularity lemmas, et cetera, give us, an additive approximation for CSP. I can satisfy whatever is the best possible plus minus an epsilon fraction. Uh, are there any non-trivial conditions under which you can get multiplicative approximations? So, uh, I mean, for not for CSPs, but maybe the advantage over a random assignment for CSPs, which is called the gain version of these CSPs. And this, we don't know even for graphs. And this is something which um, could potentially be useful, again, going to the motivation of quotes. Okay. I'll stop here. Thank you for patiently bearing with me. More questions? Okay. Yeah, so let's thank the speaker and uh, we can open for questions. So, it, it, well, yeah, like maybe a slightly sort of uh, digression, but I guess for like if I look at the algorithmic application, so like, even uh -huh. for like the uh, max cut one that you mentioned. So I, I really don't need, so you do have something like a, like I'm, I'm thinking of the reg regularity lemma and sort of the abstract form. And what you have is like, to my mind, like a proper learning analog, as in the function family that you're trying to fool is uh -huh. the same function family you are picking your, like the parts of H from. So right. I, so okay, yeah. think of, is there an improper analog? So I, I want to fool a family script F, but I can pick functions from a much larger family script G. So it's an improper learning. Right, and, right. And what you need algorithmically is this, like the the number of elements you pick is small, or like like this G. I mean, okay, in this case, it doesn't have to be cuts per se with which you <laughs> take intersections. It could be a some some other counting object like uh, yeah uh, yeah yeah no, that uh, that's a nice question I have to say I don't kind of know of uh, any maybe non-trivial examples um, uh, using I mean the, the only kind of statements I know with sort of say something like well, this function H itself is from a larger family. It's from a larger family because it's a linear combination of things from the original family. Uh, but yeah, in but in some sense, uh, picking each one of these f's uh, from some interesting larger family, I don't know an example. Yeah, uh, uh, no, it, it's a very good question, but I unfortunately don't have a good answer to give you. But yeah, Pete, yeah, just what you do. Yeah, it kind of yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, uh, yeah, suggestive of this improper learning kind of. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks.
Right, so I have a question. Uh, yeah. So is there any relation between the splittability and um, the spectral gap of this up-down walk? Um, there is. So uh, it's uh, uh, so this goes back to local spectral expansion, and uh, up-down walk is what is used to is define the local spectral expansion. One way of defining it. Splittability. So up-down walk, in, in like if you think of a hyper uh, graph as uh, downwards closed or a simplicial complex, and so not just k tuples, but you look at k minus one tuples and so on. The up down walk is you kind of go to a random uh, k minus one sub tuple, and then you complete it again to some random k tuple which contains this k minus one tuple, and so on. Right? Um, splittability kind of corresponds to uh, uh, what is called uh, a swap walk or a complement walk, where um, uh, you go to a random k minus one subtuple, but then you complete it to a k tuple which is different from what you came from. And in general, you kind of go to a random l tuple and you complete it to something which uh, uh, is, is different, and, and uh, you only kind of uh, change the complement of it. Um, and uh, there is uh, a linear relation between uh, these so called uh, swap walks, which is how we actually proved the high dimensional expanders are splittable, that you can write these. Uh, 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 so-called swap walks in terms of the regular updine walk walks as a linear combination of those. Um, and then if you know enough about the spectra of these up-down walks, you can analyze uh, these so-called, uh, we call them swap walks, uh, Irit and uh, Yotam uh, Dickstein called them uh, complement walks. But uh, yeah, so yeah, they are directly related. Although, uh, as we said, um, uh, things can be splittable even when uh, this sort of up-down walk definition may not necessarily make sense. questions yeah i have a question so you mentioned that this uh, tau splittable uh, generalizes some notion of expansion like yeah so mm -hmm. what was that about like i didn't get that comment very well so could you well, so uh, this uh, uh, notion of expansion, uh, you mean the, the structured pseudo randomness expansion that I was talking about it for hypergraphs, right? Uh, uh, no, in, in the, in the regularity lemma statement, uh, you mentioned something about that these statements are even hard to prove. For k equals to 2, also, it's non trivial for the. Ah, okay, okay, good. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so I was yeah, referring yeah. to the fact the error now on the right hand side uh, it depends on the size of w. Uh, so it's a statement which is interesting even for sparse uh, W in particular, even if you take K equals two, W is a sparse graph. And uh, now the error is not epsilon times N square, but epsilon times the number of edges in your sparse graph. Okay. Uh, but it's not true for any sparse graph. It's true for a splittable graph. A splittable graph is just an expanding graph. So it's true for an expander graph. Um, so it's saying that you can get a regularity lemma for um, an expanding graph. Uh, and the statement I showed you from freeze Kanan and so on doesn't imply it. It requires an additional uh, step in the proof. So uh, so that, that's what I was kind of trying to point out, that the fact that the error now depends on the size of W uh, and means that this statement is meaningful even for sparse collections. Um, Whereas the freeze condensed statement I showed you was not uh, necessarily giving anything non-trivial for sparse collections. And uh, for sparse graphs, there are several regularity lemmas with different flavors uh, proved by various uh, authors, Koyakawa, Rodel, Koyaugla, and Cooper Fries, uh, Ovisgara Trevisan, Bojan Pala. Uh, I didn't quite show the proof of uh, how to prove it for sparse graphs, etc. But um, I mean, it, it, uh, it's not. Uh, a big deal, but I just want to point out that uh, uh, the fact that you want some error estimate which depends on the size of the graph or um, uh, means that, I mean, this is the same as uh, n times d, which is the number of edges divided by n square. So it, it's something which can, uh, which can uh, uh, give meaningful estimates for the sparse graphs uh, is a, a somewhat non-trivial extension of the regularity lemma I showed you. I didn't tell you how to prove this extension, unfortunately, but uh, just wanted to highlight that it is different. Yeah, thanks. More questions?
okay so madhu do you have time for us like short informal q and a session maybe we yeah, can yeah, stop sure. there good yeah so yeah, let's thank wait. the speaker once again and oh, sorry did someone had a question okay so let's thank the speaker again and uh, yeah, i'll stop the recording